Hey guys, Alana here. You're listening to the Praying Christian Women podcast. It is the last Friday of March. We almost made it through the month, everybody. Congratulations. Woohoo. And in case so if you're, you're, yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh I was going to say, if you're watching this on video, either on YouTube or on our, fa on our Facebook page, um, you'll notice that my children have been sharing my Zoom and I have set them up with their own accounts. But when I logged on to Zoom, I had a space background. So it's kind of fun. So I thought I'd put it on there just for a laugh. It looks like you're about to just float off. <laughs> Wouldn't that be relaxing? Just kind of. You I mean, know what I mean? Like, I wonder if, it, like, there's probably like a person or two, like in space. Like, isn't the space station kind of always manned by at least one or two people? I think so. I mean, I don't know why it wouldn't be. And I wonder if they're like the safest people in the world right now or right? off the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure they are. And I'm sure that they do like a quarantine to make sure they're not infected with anything before they send them up anyway, oh, yeah, even absolutely. without these crazy times. Yeah. But can you imagine being up there and knowing that like, if let's say, I mean, heaven forbid, half the population gets really, really ill, you know what I mean? Like, are they going to be able to bring you back? And <laughs> just what a weird feeling that would be. Well, when I was reading about the Iditarod this year, um, they finish up, so they left. And what, how long does it take them? Like, I think it's usually weeks? like two weeks. It takes them weeks, yeah, to mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. complete it. And the person that got the is it the Red Lantern Award when the last oh the very crosses, latest, yeah. Red Lantern? Yeah, but anyway. I don't remember get, the name, but I know there's yeah, an award for the, right, for it's the, the slowest finisher, which sounds kind of funny, like, haha, you were the slowest, but actually when you think about how many people don't complete the race, yeah. I don't know the percentage, but a lot of people end up not finishing, even like real veterans who are used to it, they don't all finish, so. That's right. Um, it's more but, than like a joke award. <laughs> right, no, it's, it's definitely to celebrate, okay, we're bringing it in, and yeah. this person that finished last was saying, how surreal it was to because they were a veteran um musher mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. said how strange it was to have left and they get very yeah. little news they do get some exactly. news trickling in mm -hmm. and they noticed of course at some of the checkpoints but for the most part they said we didn't understand really what this meant i know and well, then they and came back how much yeah their energies focus on completing this race and surviving, you know, in the freezing cold for two weeks. Yeah. It would be very surreal. It was. And the city of Nome was very like adamantly urging people to stay away um, right. because normally it's just a zoo there, you know, big people party are so at the excited. Finish line. Yeah. Right? And they said they weren't even announcing the mm -hmm. finishers over the loudspeaker. It was Aww. just really kind of That's a sad. sad. It yeah. was. So, yeah, but that's the closest that I can think of to being just, you know, off the grid. And then you come back to, oh my goodness, this is. I know. Crazy. Well, I guess there's some reality show. Did you hear about that? Where like mm -hmm. everybody's sequestered in a big house and they have to live together as roommates. And they went weeks before they told people. And then they told people like on the air. I didn't watch it, I just read about it. And to me, that was just, that's really pretty awful. Oh, so like a big brother thing, like, uh, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Like the big brother show. Oh, and so there were people in, that's right. Because they don't get news and stuff. Mm -hmm. So they made a big, that's kind of, that's kind of like the people that reveal that they've been cheating on their husband on a talk show. Like that It really is. You know, I like know. sensationalizing the People, it, it's a tragedy Pain. for people and it's going to be traumatic to find out that way. And yet you're doing it on, you know, international TV to get, you know, to get your, your rankings up. It, it really bothered me that they would do it that way. That is bothersome, especially when not everybody was in on it. You know, I mean, it's one thing. Right. Yeah. That's, uh, that's really that stinks. Mm -hmm. that stinks. <laughs> yeah. I did hear a funny story about this guy who went on like a two week, like solitary in the desert kind of like wilderness self exploration thing. Mm -hmm. And then came back to the epidemic. <laughs> now pandemic. I'm like, yeah, that's, that'd be pretty crazy. That would be. Well, are you willing to share the cool story from your fiction group? that happened or is that something you don't want to share on the air because I was just thinking how encouraging mm -hmm. that story was is that something that you kind of feel is more 
Well, we can give like the, the, the bare basics of what we did. Yeah. So maybe yeah. I can explain what we did and you can explain because I know that um, you were kind of involved in the communication side yeah. of it at least. I just thought, yeah, with all the, you know, I, I think it'd be really cool to share an encouraging story because that made yeah. a whole day to see that. Oh, that's cool. Okay. So a couple weeks ago, I took like nine or 12 of my novels and put them into one sort of ebook bundle and sent it out to the readers in my readers group and said, hey, this is just like a pay what you can. And it also, if you're in need of groceries or toiletries, here's a link where you can let us know what your needs are. And we're going to try to use this fundraiser to help as many people as we can. And so we got a lot of responses. People were able to get books for their e-reader plus contribute what they could to help other readers in the group. Um, and so I don't, I don't even remember the details. So you can, you can take it from there. This is our tag team storytelling. Well, so I don't, I didn't realize that part of it. I thought it was just a general, Hey, does anybody need anything? But, oh, uh -huh. but basically what happened is one of the people in the group is um, fosters sick animals and, and saves them from uh, shelters or the street. I don't mm -hmm, even know the mm -hmm. details of that, yeah, yeah. but I know that she has needs to feed them and was having trouble because of just all that was going on. Mm -hmm. um, and she needed um, specifically wet cat food for the, um, for the, the sick cats that couldn't right, dry right. food. And mm -hmm. she said, I just wanted to let you know that I shared in our readers group that I needed this cat food. And all of a sudden I got a package from Amazon of wet cat food mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. she was just so thankful. And like, you know, it wasn't like, Oh, I need a ventilator for my hospital. And it showed up, you know, it's right. It's right. Of man, like this, this woman, it, it wasn't like a big, huge, like my mortgage got paid, but this is like, mm -hmm. this made a huge difference in this woman's yeah. life. Small thing that made a big difference. It yeah. was. And I mean, what a heartwarming story of how your group was able to come together. So mm -hmm. knowing what I know now, that is just such a great, you know, that's something anybody can do as just mm -hmm. an individual is send out right. an email and say, hey guys, um, are there any needs? And for those of us that, that could contribute... I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you would do that, but whatever you would do. Yeah, it really just depends. You know, I even had some people who were like, hey, you know, I've read all your books, but I want to contribute anyway. And so they just sent um, Amazon gift cards. We were able to send um, maybe like up to a dozen people, like a significant amount of groceries or toiletries or, you know, a couple of pet food scenarios and it was really cool. Oh, um, that's amazing. Yeah. So actually yesterday I started up kind of round two of this fundraiser. Um, so it's at alanaterry.com slash novels, which that page is up always. It's got just a link of all of my novels, but at the top, at least for as long as a fundraiser goes on, I bundled up. Um, that was a fundraiser for one of my suspense novels and that fundraiser is over, but I bundled up some of my romance books and women's fiction books, thinking that some people just might like something lighter, um, more on the encouraging side, as opposed to more on the like scary, spooky side. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're doing kind of another fundraiser like that. And, and this time it's probably going to go toward just like local relief work through United Way or Red Cross or things like that. But um, yeah, it feels, it feels nice to be able to do something, um, even if it's just, you know, providing pet food for somebody no and, and that's just I don't know the gratitude in her mm -hmm. message I mean mm -hmm. just yeah I loved yeah that. that was such a heartwarming story so yeah speaking so of cats and heartwarming stories this guy's grandma was um isolated well actually quarantined in her nursing home room because she's tested positive and so, you know, can't have visitors or things like that. So this guy went on Twitter and was like, my grandma loves cats. Can I have a few cat pictures to like print up and tape to her wall? And he got like 50,000 responses or Aww. something like that. And then I heard another, um, another lady. So this is in my Facebook group, just for my readers, group, the same one we were talking about. So you might've seen the post. I just, you know, asked how people were doing. And one lady, her whole community has organized this little like teddy bear hunt. And so you take a teddy bear and you put it in your window or on your porch or somewhere by your house. And then parents and kids can just hop in the car 
or, um, you know, drive around town. It's like a scavenger hunt, you know, like how many of these teddy bears can you find? It's oh, really that cute. Is really fun. And mm-hmm. do they, is it like, it, so it's, it's just a, like, you just drive randomly around town. It's not like, a I think so. Thing. I That's mean, fun. it might be something I know, like we're not on our local neighbor watch. What's the, the group called where you can next door. Next door, yeah. Like, we're not on that, but I assume that it's kind of being coordinated through things like that. That's really neat. I thought it was cute. hmm Yeah. Were you the one telling the story about the teachers driving, like, doing a little parade through the neighborhood? That was cute, too. Yeah, that is really neat. Because, and it's been, yeah, I mean, I know the, the teachers are missing the students <clears throat> and. Yeah. hmm And worried about them, you know, like, how would you not. Yeah, especially, I mean, I've heard multiple teachers mention, not personally, but just either, like on social mm-hmm, media, but mm-hmm. saying, you know, every break and every summer that they always are concerned for the well-being of certain students that they I know, know are in aren't different. being well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is kind of tough for them. <sighs> it is. Yeah. It's one of those... Um, you know, it's just a heavy feeling knowing that there's a lot of, a lot of people in a lot of need. And, you know, I love hearing about people who are using this time for extra prayer because I think, you know, the world in general needs it for sure. Yeah. I read a, an encouraging story today. There were two guys in Italy mm-hmm. that ran some kind of like, um, what do you call it? Uh, where you make stuff out of this is so silly. Like they have a 4D printer. Is that or 3D printer? What do you a call 3D it? Printer. 3D yeah. printer. 3D printer. Oh, right, right, right. And yeah. um, they have a 3D I know printer. Mean, yeah. Yeah. And they heard that the hospital had these disposable valves that they had to change off of the ventilators for each mm-hmm. individual patient. And they were running out and they didn't have any more mm-hmm. left. So they actually went to the hospital, got one of the, the, pieces Mm -hmm. took it back and just they said it took kind of a while because one of the um one of the openings was like a millimeter in diameter Mm -hmm. that that whatever was you know flowed through and Mm -hmm. um they said that finally they got it so that it was working and they tested 50 of them and all 50 worked so then they asked for, for orders so they were saying that they were willing to donate their design for anyone that wants oh, cool. to reproduce it in their local vicinity that has a 3D printer and that they, you know, but then they warned, well, some, ven- not all ventilators use this. Have the same one, about. but for the ones who do, yeah. you know, Isn't it's that- amazing. Yeah. I just, think- oh, I just love those stories. And I love that, especially with social media, those stories get to come out and not just, you know, like every day, Alaska numbers and worldwide numbers are doubling. I mean, it's, it's exponential growth. Um, and so it's encouraging that the other sweet stories are coming out. It is. I have a, uh, what would you call it? It's not a positive story, but I can apply my Uh don't be a hater, like imagining what Mm -hmm. that person must be going through to help me not to be, you know, Uh negative. So yesterday I had to go to Costco. We were out of several things and I thought I could either go to the regular store and get milk and eggs or I could go to Costco, get more and, you know, shop less frequently. Consolidate trips. Yeah. yeah. So I, cause I, I wanted to do just curbside delivery and then I thought, well, I'll brave Costco, be careful. So I got to Costco. They did an excellent job of, we got there all of the grocery carts were in a row, sterilized, sanitized, and they only had mm-hmm. one opening that you could go into. Mm-hmm. And the other one was blocked off for exit only. So they had one-way traffic. Mm-hmm. And so I got there. They had the line stopped so that they could wait until enough people had gone. They were only letting certain people mm-hmm. in it at a mm-hmm. time. It was really well run. So I go in there. I have gloves. Um, you know, did I you was, bring the kids or did you just go by yourself? Oh, no, no, no. No, just by myself. Or, uh-huh. Yeah, I didn't even want to. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My husband was home and I That's just nice. didn't want to mm-hmm. bring the kids. So I went in, I was being very careful. I get about halfway done with my trip and I'm thinking, okay, I need peanut butter. Let me go down this aisle to take a shortcut. And at the end of the aisle from me, which is pretty long, thank you, Lord. Um, there's a woman with her husband and she's hacking and coughing, mm-hmm. not covering her mouth, no mask, nothing. And just 
hacking and hacking and coughing all over the place. Not like on purpose, like the person in the news that yeah, right. all over. I mean, good grief. Anyway, but it was, she's hacking and coughing. And I, I mean, I hightailed it out of that area, but I was starting to think, oh my goodness, how much stuff in this store is now contaminated with water droplets with her mm-hmm, coughing, mm-hmm. you know, and I got really mad. I mean, because mm. I'm feeling like mama bear protective of my kids mad. Right, right. Like, here I am trying to, you know, feed my family, try to do it in the most responsible way possible mm-hmm. with the least number of trips. And I got this person. Mm. But what I did was I took my angry feelings and I said, okay, you know, use your system. And so I put myself in her position because at first I thought she's with her husband. If she was sick, she could have stayed home and he could have done the shopping alone. But I tried to do my put yourself in that person's place. Mm-hmm. It was an older couple. And I thought to myself, my mom had dementia. There was a yeah. time when she That's where my home. mind went too. Yeah. Couldn't be left at home. Either she's too frail to be left <clears throat> at home mm-hmm. or she's mentally either unstable yep. or mentally, you know, mm-hmm. impaired. And yeah. Can't, can't and what are you going to do? No, I get it. I've got... Um, yeah. I know of an elderly person with, I don't know if it's officially Alzheimer's, but basically can't. Their adult son had to come move in with them because they're afraid that she's just going to forget that there's a pandemic right? and, you know, go out and do her shopping and things like that. And no, I get it. That's kind of where my mind went to. And I'm sure I would have had a similar reaction, but again, you don't know, you know, you don't know. So just keep that in mind. And, you know, I thought, well, then at least put a mask on her. But with my mom, she got very agitated with stuff that she didn't understand Mm. why it was there. Well, and there's a shortage, you know, like there's a shortage. Yeah. I have a mask. I haven't needed to pull it out, but I went to Las Vegas for a writer's conference for the last two years. And the first year, just the the smoke in the casino was where we, the hotel where we were staying was really bad. So I, I got just like a $15 face mask with a little filter. And so I've got it, but to be honest, I would feel a little bit awkward wearing it in public knowing that there is such a shortage, you know? So I had that problem too, because we have like, five, I think left of, Mm -hmm. um, these just dust masks from construction. Well, yeah. Or like we live in volcano area. Like were you guys, you weren't in Alaska. Were you in Mount Redoubt erupted? No, I think. Yeah. Was Cause before, Silas was just a baby. Yeah, so that was it would have been a yeah, yeah. couple years before you got to Alaska, yeah. but, but we've never been without, yeah, we've never been fires. without dust masks yeah, for that reason. But you know, they're not medical grade masks. Right. But, but probably better you know, than nothing. I better would Better than nothing. But Matt was, Matt gave me one and I didn't put it on because I felt mm. bad. I thought, you know what, here, there's a shortage. People uh, you know, and not to mention, no, they tell you it really probably the distance between people and Costco was great. Mm-hmm. Like there were not yeah, a lot of people. Yeah. So I felt like we probably should conserve that in case we really do need it. If someone gets I sick, I want the sick person in our house to be wearing a mask. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we'll have our five masks, one for each of us. <laughs> now, did you do anything with your groceries or did you just bring them in the house and put them away? No, after that in particular, I was thinking anyway of doing it, but after that, seeing that woman that was coughing all over the place, I thought, um, you know, absolutely we needed to do something. So I had taken my gloves off inside out that I had used in the store um, because we had some, again, for laying tile, we had just some Mm -hmm. like rubber gloves. And um, so I took those off, but then I went out and we got whatever was not perishable, we left in my car Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the garage. So stuff wasn't going to freeze, but we left it in the car in the garage and we're going to leave it there for a few days. That's not a bad idea. Because the virus is supposed to not be able to survive more than a few days on Mm -hmm, surfaces. mm -hmm. The stuff that was not able to be left, um, we took like sandy wipes and Mm -hmm. just wiped down the outside the things that could be taken out like there's milk that comes in a three pack in a card right with the plastic or something yeah we Mm -hmm. opened up the cardboard container and then with clean hands I took the milk out one by one and Mm -hmm. then we disposed of Mm -hmm. the cardboard in the recycling stuff like that and we just wiped down everything that couldn't be otherwise yeah it sounds like you you took reasonable precautions honestly even if you hadn't it probably would have been okay it probably would have and you know, I just, I, I'm, 
you can only do what you can do. You can't go exactly. crazy worrying. But I figure, you know, might as well take precautions, especially given the fact that I saw that there was a person that might have For been sure. at mm-hmm. least some kind of sick in the in the For sure. Yeah. So I didn't realize this, but in a lot of the Alaska villages, RSV is is mm. uh, rampant right now. And Uh-oh. so they're having trouble because typically airlines bring people like babies and young children with RSV where it can be very serious or fatal. They transport them when they don't have to be medevaced. They use airline transport to get them back Mm -hmm. and forth Mm -hmm. from the outlying villages to Mm -hmm. wherever they need to go, Anchorage or other places. And, um, they're not allowing them now. And so there's this big, like, oh boy, what do we do now? Because we've, if you have any symptoms, you're not allowed on the airline, but you've got these babies with RSV that are needing transport, but they don't have the, you know, medevac. And so they're trying to work this all wow. out. So, you know, during the COVID epidemic or pandemic, there's this RSV epidemic going on in some of the I villages. hadn't heard. Yeah. yeah I just well, heard that yesterday. Yeah, Alaska is such a unique spot. You know, I think a lot of our listeners would be surprised to learn just how remotely many Alaskans live. You know, you and I both live kind of a typical suburb, like you could transplant our house and put it somewhere in the lower 48 and it wouldn't look too different. Right. But so many people live either really, really rural where it's four or five hours to drive to get groceries or we have, have have I know, flown in. Yes, I know of a family who lives kind of out toward McCarthy, which is real remote, and their little general store is rationing. It's just two rolls of toilet paper per family per week because that's all there's room for, you Did know. You say and so two rolls, two rolls, not two packages. Wow. Um, and you know, then there are villages where you can only fly in and out of. Supplies can only be flown in and out of. To get to medical appointments, you've got to fly in and out. It's a very interesting situation, although it makes me wonder if some of the uh, villages that are off the road system, if they're going to be more protected. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I wonder if they get to, they're, they're already so isolated. I wonder if they get to kind of just remain in isolation. I don't know. I don't know either. Um Either that or it gets even worse because it's, it is hard to get medical attention. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just in terms of having even testing available for the villages or exactly. now at this point, how do you distinguish between RSV and mm-hmm. COVID? It's probably now, very hard. Does RSV, like we, we were aware of RSV just because when our NICU baby came home, that was the biggest thing. So I don't know about it other than like medically fragile babies, you've got to be worried. Is it something that also impacts the elderly and, or is it just kind of for babies? I don't know that either. I know that RSV is like just in any newborn, they always say, be careful, make sure young kids wash their hands because RSV is like, you know, kids get it and it goes through schools like crazy and it's not. Oh, okay. In- so even school age, I just knew of it as like yeah. the NICU baby disease that you right. have to be worried about. <laughs> well, and I think to my knowledge, you have to be really careful with NICU babies, of course. And then newborn babies, you also just any newborn yeah, yeah, yeah. is really right. susceptible to RSV. It could mm-hmm. be, it could be hard or fatal. Okay. Um, so anyway, um, but yeah, I don't know about elderly if they're also okay. affected. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. All of these like different, different little facets of this whole issue that are just kind of mm-hmm. coming to light of these right. little struggles that, that you just never Yeah. Different think. communities have to face that you don't mm-hmm. think about. Yeah, yeah. You know, that would be a good point for prayer today is, you know, the real rural, the real isolated. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's totally different. We never lived off the road system, but we did live like for a four or five hour drive from like a hospital hospital. We've had two of our kids have had to be flown in for medevac situations. Um, it's it's a different different way of living. And, and in a way, it's kind of like, well, like we used to live in a town of about 300 people. And you could look at it, well, they're pretty isolated. Not many people are coming in and out. The people who do live there live like a mile away from each other. <laughs> they're yeah. social distancing like year in and year out. But right. on the other hand, if it does come into a community like that, they're far from medical attention. Um, 
at least where we were, it was it was a more elderly population. So I don't know. It's one of those, um, yeah, just unique struggles where we're really just going to kind of have to see how it plays out, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And things are, you know, it seems like things are kind of starting to get really bad in some of the big cities right now. And mm -hmm. just as we, that, you know, that's just medical personnel, supplies, protective gear, mm -hmm. having enough ventilators, having enough of everything seems to yeah. be on people's minds. So this is kind of, I think this next week will be sort of the pivot point. Now I have a theory that this you know, as far as the numbers go, because like I, I kind of mm -hmm. have enjoyed, enjoyed, I haven't enjoyed, I have <laughs> found it in some ways therapeutic to get a handle on things and feel like I know what's going on, to look at the mm -hmm. curves for different places and how they're going, you know, just mm -hmm. to see. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, it seems like there's been a kind of a bottleneck of testing and there still kind of is, but it's opening up now. At least they're saying that in Alaska. And I think they're saying that probably in more places now. They're able to test more because they're getting, like in Alaska, they found a way to make swabs, which was the bottleneck here for sure. Okay. You know, um, mm -hmm. They've been able to make them locally. And I'm sure <clears throat> in other places, testing has been limited. So I kind of feel like this next week or so, we might have false until the number of tests available catch up to the number of people wanting to be tested I feel like we're mm -hmm. going to see this super sharp curve of cases right right and that 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 we should remember not to freak out necessarily about that when we see it and to just keep in mind that you know we do have we're, we're trying to catch up with testing and hopefully you know I don't know my hope is that it's not as bad as it's looking right now, but it, yeah. you know, cause it's looking really, you know, it's looking pretty grim right now for the, the curves. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I guess just trying to keep in perspective, the fact that we're the bottleneck That's a good of point, testing yeah. is opening up. And mm -hmm. I think the real indicator of the seriousness is the curve of, of the death toll because they're not going to miss deaths. I think when they see deaths from, these serious Ill these serious respiratory illnesses, they're going to count that. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I feel like that would be a better indicator yeah. of the number, but I don't know. That's just, I, I don't know if that's medically accurate or not. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it definitely can get a lot more grim than it is right now. It still feels a tiny bit like calm before the storm, yeah. you know, um, at just, least here in Alaska. I know some places are kind of already into the epicenter stage. Yeah. Um, like I'm thinking of New York in particular. Exactly, they just seem yeah. like they're, you know, they're densely populated, lots mm -hmm. of needs and, you know, yeah. it's, it's just very, I know a, a nurse passed away, like a young nurse passed mm. away yesterday. So it's just, yeah, I think okay. right now we just definitely need wisdom for our leaders, which happens to be yeah. the prayer guide prayer point for today is that. Oh, nice um, segue. <laughs> right. I didn't mean that. <laughs> but, As we um, give each other big winks. <laughs> But yeah, just wisdom for our leaders to know, because we can't know. I mean, nobody, mm -hmm. nobody can see the future. It could go either way. And right now it's looking like, um, you know, we just don't want to be in the position of having more needs than, than equipment. And yeah, so not to bring it down, but I'm going to bring it down. Bring it down. What are your thoughts on this whole thing about like mandatory DNRs and, Basically, like if if you're over a certain age and we're short of ventilators, what what are your thoughts on all that? Yeah, I did not read much about it. I saw the headline that basically was yeah. saying that they're proposing mandatory not the do not do resuscitate. not resuscitate. And so, the explanation was basically like if somebody if a COVID nineteen patient codes, the amount of invasive treatment that it would take to save them is going to put like a lot of people at risk. Like they were talking about on a typical code, you can have like over a dozen 
nurses and doctors who are responding. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of, uh, what sort I'm looking for? A lot of opportunity for the virus to spread in that case. And so they're proposing kind of making it, I don't know if a mandate would be the right word or just a protocol or basically saying we don't want, and I, I, on one hand, I appreciate this side of it. They're saying we don't want doctors and nurses to have to make this call like on a patient per patient basis. Right. Because what a terrible thing to have to decide. So it's at least being considered to have that be standard protocol that if a COVID-19 patient codes that they are not resuscitated, or I know like there were headlines from Italy where some people just couldn't get on, there weren't enough ventilators. And so if you were over a certain age, you just didn't get one. And again, like I said, I didn't mean to bring this down, but this, this could be what our hospital systems are going to be facing like within the next week or two. Yeah. Well, we need to pray for that too, for the people. First of all, I, I love the idea that they're looking at making very clear guidelines for this. I, I can't say like, I wouldn't want to comment on what those guidelines are, whether I agree mm -hmm. or disagree, but right. I feel like maybe if they said, you know, rather than making a nationwide or whatever, maybe leave it statewide or maybe leave it hospital to hospital, but to instruct these hospitals, it seems like probably each hospital would need well, I don't know. Maybe. No, I wouldn't want to put it on the no, hospitals. Maybe maybe statewide because it seems like every state is different right now, very different. So, but I don't know. Are, is it a nationwide thing they're trying to do? I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, that's well, a little bit harder, but like so, I yeah. I appreciate that they're trying to save the doctors and nurses from having to make that call. Right. And in that way, <clears throat> you would be able to I feel like it should definitely not be a blanket thing. Like what I would hate to see happen is for them to say, no, uh, you know, no uh, resuscitation for anyone in order to protect doctors and nurses. And yet you have a, you know, let's say it's a hospital in Alaska where we have some cases. We have a couple of hospitals. Oh, I see what you mean, but we're not kind of overrun yet. But we're not is that overrun. kind of what you mean? Right. Mm. So for them to make that call and yet you do have the available staff, you do have the available um, protective equipment, but someone's life ends because of this mandate hmm. that I for, see that side of it you too. Know, so I can totally, mm -hmm. I definitely think that desperate times for sure call for really hard decisions and when it comes to something mm -hmm. like this if you're exposing tons of people with the idea that they're working with hospital patients and they could conceivably you know end up you don't want the doctors and nurses sick. getting sick well you don't want them yeah. getting sick and you don't want them being carriers and infecting more people that are the not. other people yeah. yeah good point so it's so hard yeah, I mean, it's, it's, so it's we're really, I mean, these are kind of impossible. It would be wonderful. Wouldn't it be great if you and I could just sit here safe and healthy and say everybody should be given the same amount of medical care, regardless of age, you know, like, sure, we can say that, but yeah, what a mess. But it's triage, you know, it's wartime triage. It truly is. It, that's that's a good way to look at it. And so in places where it's like wartime, you have to really make these hard choices. And I would yeah. never never fault anyone for making those kinds of choices. It, it seems like there's a degree of wisdom in where that's coming from when it comes to that. So I don't know how you make it so it works so that it's working and doing what it should be for the patients that are, um, I'm sorry, what, what should I say? So that it's having the positive effect that it, it will have if you have you know, no more um, resuscitation of these critical, critical cases, that it's having the positive benefit in places where it has to, where there's no other yeah. choice. And yet yeah. you have other situations where maybe they have a little bit more freedom and a little bit more, I mean, it, I guess it doesn't negate the fact that they're still being exposed to this deadly right. Yeah, I mean, let's say, deadly exactly. <laughs> let's say it gets as bad in Alaska three weeks from now as it is in New York right now. Right. You know, just because we have the medical staff right now. Do, so I I'm, I'm guess I'm not comfortable giving an opinion other than, wow, what a heavy, 
heavy thing, what heavy decisions are being made and are going to have to be made. And what I love is that we can look at how grim and bleak this whole situation is and yet still have hope Mm -hmm. and still recognize God's on the throne. God is in control. None of this is out of his care. And you know, the other way to look at it, what a blessing that like ventilators exist, you know, masks exist, germ theory exists. Mm -hmm. And we, we've, for, for our entire lives have taken that for granted. We've taken for granted the fact that if we need medical attention, we're going to get life-saving medical attention. And I, I guess, yes, this is sobering and I feel a tad guilty for, for making it such a downer, but also, isn't it amazing that we can, even in a situation like who would have thought two months ago, Jamie, that you and I would be having a conversation anywhere close to this scope. And yet God hasn't changed. When we were talking two months ago about funny things we want to have in our prayer room, and we were joking about like having a barista, (laughs) you know, and And a a massage therapist and a wraparound porch. God knew that, you know, this really heavy stuff was coming. And we had joy back then. We laughed. We have joy right now and we're still laughing, but so much has changed. And yet God hasn't changed at all. And so Mm -hmm. I guess that's why I'm choosing to not apologize for heavy things. I don't think that as Christians, we're supposed to just bury our heads and ignore the facts that, you know, things, I think things are going to get bad or they're going to get really bad, right? Yep. Before they, and then they're going to get better. Yep. And, and that's the other thing to remember. Um, <clears throat> already in China, things are on the upswing. Like it, it seems to me that all the research is indicating that China is over the worst of it. Which means that wherever you're living, wherever you're listening, eventually, give it a month or two, you're going to be over the worst of it. And we know that the worst is coming still. It's very scary. It's very sobering. But how amazing that God hasn't changed and isn't going to change. And, you know, if you think about like we're in the, I think we're in the hundreds of thousands now of Mm -hmm. cases worldwide or something like that. Um, and that God is in, intricately familiar with each and every individual. And those of us who are going to fall sick, he knows that. Those of us who are going to pull through, he knows that. Those of us who aren't, he knows that. And how, how big of a blessing is it to know that, yeah, even if we succumb to this disease, that we get to go straight to heaven. Um, there are in spite of the dire situation we're in, there are so many reasons to be hopeful. Even like, let's, let's, I don't want to say take heaven out of the picture, but like, I believe that there's hope on even just um, a physical earthly level as well. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. This is not going to last for decades. This is, you know, like if China's over its worst and it peaked what in maybe January, that means that probably three months from now, At the latest, I would guess we're going to be on the other side of it, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's that's not terrible. Three months, and yeah, it's going to get bad or it's going to get really bad. I I do believe that, but I also believe that the end is not too far from sight. Yep. No, I agree. And I think if we refrain, you know, if we take the you know, head in the sand approach and we just kind of pretend like everything is okay and we mm-hmm. watch Netflix and play games and don't even entertain the thought that, you know, that there's some really bad stuff going on. We're going to miss opportunities for God to show us how to pray. And so okay. I think it's through these discussions about the hard stuff that we can sort of flesh out because, you know, I wasn't even thinking about those hospital decisions in light of, wow, we've got to be praying for the leaders of the, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of the whatever hospital board or the CDC or whoever's going to make those. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we definitely need to have these conversations and just remember not to, we can have these conversations in a productive way, in a positive way, in a way that Mm -hmm. leads to prayer in a way yeah. that leads to, you know, just understanding better and just being better informed mm-hmm. without dwelling on it. And I think there's a difference. Right. So yeah. we just need to catch ourselves. <clears throat> for sure. There's a place for Netflix. There's a place for games. We got um, like that lawn game ladder ball where you throw the little 
balls. I, for, I don't know how to describe it, but we set that up yesterday. That was super fun. Our fun. puppy learned how to catch a Frisbee this morning, uh-huh. you know, and, and I don't feel guilty. I feel like I can recognize that things are in a really scary situation. Sorry. <laughs> I've got a kid listening to music if that's uh, making noise in the background. I can uh, hear it. Oh, okay. I recognize things are bad, but I also recognize that we have so many reasons to be hopeful and thankful. And it's, it's kind of weird that both can kind of coexist, Mm -hmm. but I really feel like, you know, that that's for sure the gift of faith is being Mm -hmm. able to look these scary things right in the eye and just say, you know what, God's not going to allow anything to happen to me that he is not in control of. Yeah. And I, I have felt for sure a sense of very divine protection for me and my family, not a guarantee that everything's going to turn out rosy, but just this sense of God is so in control right now. And that is a true gift. Yeah. I mean, God is victorious over anything that can happen. Yeah. And that includes mm-hmm. death. I mean, if it comes yeah. right down to it, that's what uh, I, w- I mentioned this um, ooh, I forgot to link to that podcast thing the other day. But anyway, the pastor mm-hmm. that was also, or I'm sorry, the Christian doctor that did the podcast episode. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. About On, um, a calculated Christian risk. response to mm-hmm. COVID. Yeah. One of the things that he talked about was, okay, first think about if you have a fear response, which all of us should be having some level of fear response to this mm-hmm. because it's mm-hmm. a God-given protective mechanism. Right. But he said, past that like initial, whew, this is a, this is a serious thing. I need to take note of it. Um, what is your, carry that fear out to its logical conclusion or maybe look mm-hmm. down into the fear. So you're afraid of COVID-19. You're afraid of being exposed to it. You're afraid of getting it. You're afraid of getting super sick. You're afraid of maybe being hospitalized and ultimately our fears of death. That's what we're afraid Mm -hmm. of here is the death Mm -hmm. of ourselves, the death of loved ones. Um, If we knew that the entire earth would get COVID-19 and recover just fine, I don't think there would be, we'd just be like, whatever, let's just go on with life. But we know that there is death and that's, that's what so many are afraid of. And he said, you know, what we have to remember is that even if the absolute worst thing were to happen, in, in our book, which is death, God is still on the throne. And that's what it boils down to. And for some people that might not be super comforting, but I, it, I think we have to get to the place where if we can't look at, okay, God will provide, even if death occurs in my life, in someone's life I love, um, then, you know, I, if I'm not at the place where I can not that we don't have resistance to that, but that you can't at least acknowledge, okay, but I know that God is still good and that he will provide for my family, Mm -hmm. for my friends, that we need to do some more soul searching and some prayer and some, okay, God, give me more faith. And I can't, uh, I can't deny the fact that there are times, not necessarily during this particular thing, but there've been some really significant times in my life where I've struggled with the fear of death and disease or something, you know, that I thought was an issue that could have gotten worse. And um, particularly with regard to my kids and just thinking how, how, what would happen to them if I, if I wasn't there to help them. And um, I had to do some soul searching and prayer and really, um, I don't know. And, and that, that recurs. I mean, I don't like the idea of getting sick and Mm -hmm. I don't know. This has really gotten bad, right? I've taken us way down to the bottom. I started it. I I'm the one who started it bad. Um, you know, but to say, if we don't want to publish this episode, we don't have to, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to bring it down even more. I take to difference when Christians kind of treat it flippantly, like what's the worst that can happen? I die because Right. Maybe it's because I'm an author who writes suspense novels and I have a big imagination and I do a lot of research into crime. Like there's a lot of things worse than dying. <laughs> you yeah, know? There are. Yes, there are. <laughs> so let's, let's keep that in mind. But again, it, what an amazing gift to be able to look such an uncertain future straight in the eye and to realize like nothing can touch you that God is not in control of. Right. And I think that that is such a powerful, like I picture you in Costco and I picture you like worried about 
contracting germs and things like that. But if God meant for you to not contract COVID-19 on your Costco trip, you were so divinely protected every single step. You know, I think I've been thinking a lot about Psalm 91 and how it's talking about like, no disaster is going to befall your tent. No, I don't believe that this is a blanket statement. Christians are going to get sick. Christians are going to die from this disease. So this obviously is not a blanket statement that Christians are not going to get ill. But unless it is your time and unless God has, I don't want to sound too fatalistic, but unless God has, you know, ordained it, that, that germ cannot touch you and it cannot touch the ones you love. And that's kind of powerful as well. Yeah, no, I think it is. And on the flip side though, not to take that and run with it as a thing sure. like, you know, it, this yeah. is, it's, well, let's have a church meeting with a thousand people hugging and sweating right? on each other. I mean, no, so do much that. of this is a balance, a balancing act of, mm-hmm. yes, we, yeah, but no, I, I absolutely agree. The thing that I would love for people to take away from this episode is that thing that you just said about nothing that can happen to you is outside of God's, what did you say? Repeat it again. I have no idea. Like I, I don't want to use the word preordained, but that's no, kind of what I mean. Not control, you know, but like basically, there is there is nothing, nothing that can happen, nothing that can happen that is outside of God's control and authority and sovereignty. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. but let's and, not forget the fact that our prayers can also change the course of human outcome as well. So I don't want people to get so fatalistic that it's just, eh, if I'm going to get sick, I'm going to get sick. Or eh, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. I don't think that that's the right attitude either. I think it's just, it's it's almost a paradox, which I know for our Western brains is hard to accept. But just this this paradox of God works miracles and God is powerful, coupled with the fact that this is a virulent, deadly disease, you know, like, and finding a way for those to coexist in your mind, finding a way to say, I, I hate to say like, sound like a downer, but I need to stop apologizing for that. I think the next few weeks things are going to get at least a little bit worse and perhaps a lot worse. And being able to realize that and say, I still have hope that God's going to mm-hmm. bring an end to this. God can snap his fingers and totally resolve this issue. And you might have a loved one that you're praying for and your prayers might be what protects that individual from contracting the disease or from dying from the disease. So I don't want to, while we talk about God's sovereignty, I don't want that to turn into just let's all be fatalistic and give up praying because I, I absolutely believe that one person praying can impact this entire course of the pandemic. Right. And I absolutely don't want to get to heaven and realize, man, I wish I had prayed harder. I wish I had, you know, interceded more. So that's another way to look at this whole issue, especially since a lot of us do have extra time on our hands to, um, to have that kind of burden for prayer is going to be huge. And even for the people who aren't going to get sick, there are so many people living in absolute panic right now. And those people need our prayers too. Society needs our prayers or or things are going to fall into further chaos. Um, So I, I absolutely want us to sit in complete awe of God's sovereignty. (laughs) And at the same time, recognize that our prayers can make, like they can change the course of this next couple weeks. Yeah. And not to ignore, I think, you know, as we have this heightened awareness of, you know, well, okay. So for me, being at home more, I have a more heightened awareness of my thoughts. I have more time on my hands to think rather than go, go, go and do all different things. And so I feel like it's important to, to be really aware of God's nudgings of the prayer burdens that come up and, and Mm -hmm. to look at the things that makes us, make us anxious as sort of like signal flags from God, you know, when you so feel that anxiety, just mm-hmm. be like, yes, oh God, this bothers me. I'm going to pray for that, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just, I think that, that do not, more than ever, any other time, do not ignore the promptings to pray that God has given mm-hmm. you. And some of that could spring from anxiety and, can. and yeah. things that cause you to kind of take notice. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Well, do you want to dive into some prayer or did you want to go through the devotion? Yeah. Well, what do you think? Do you want to just I don't do... know. I mean, you're more familiar with the devotion. Like, I think it's cool to do, but I also think that just these conversations are, are cool and good too. Maybe our readers, or our, our readers, <laughs> our listeners could let us know um, what's useful for them. So leave us a comment. So it w- was it last time, the last episode we recorded? Um, one of our recent episodes, we kind of finished off with yeah. the devotional that, um, or at the very least, it's let's tell people where they can get it. So it's prayingchristianwomen.com slash be the light mm-hmm. to download our 14 day devotional. Um, and I will leave it up to you if you want to close with that or if you want to close in just a general prayer. Yeah, let's just pray. We can we can always go back and do that. Let's just today, we had a couple of things that were bullet points. We talked about people that are isolated, um, like isolated villages and different things. Right, that are, right. And we talked about decision making and... You know, let's just, let's just do our own prayer today. Can I share something Yeah. Um, like a, a fun tip that I saw mm-hmm, real quick mm-hmm. to lighten things up before we pray? Yeah. Um, so uh, I saw this thing that said, um, since we're supposed to be washing our hands for like 20 full seconds, is that right? 20 seconds? Mm-hmm, is it 30, mm-hmm. 20 full seconds? 20. Take those 20 seconds and pray. So use that mm-hmm. as a prayer reminder. And I thought that was like, since we're all washing our hands so much more, hopefully, um, yeah. use that as a prayer reminder to end yeah. and pray during that 20 seconds. That's neat. I wonder how long it would take most people to recite the Lord's prayer. I wonder if that kind of would fall into that 20 second category or not. That could be cool. It could, or it could inspire people to pray, to wash their hands for like minutes at a time. I mean, <laughs> till like all of our skin's fallen off. Ew. <laughs> I'm getting really dry hands. It's getting a little painful. <laughs> I actually, I was wondering if other people had that same experience because mm-hmm. my hands, mm-hmm. I've not been using lotion after washing uh-huh. my hands and they're really, really dry. Yeah. Well, and I have a little bit of an allergy to certain soaps and I haven't done the, like the scientific method to figure out exactly exactly what it is. I just know that some soaps make me kind of break out in these little bumps and some don't. Mm -hmm. And right now it's like soap is soap. (laughs) And so (laughs) anyway, um, wash your hands. Don't forget to pray. How about that? Are those our two takeaways? (laughs) That sounds good. All right. I have no idea whose turn it is to start with prayer. Do you? Why don't you start? Because I think last time I just ended with the whole devotional. So you start and then I'll let's do it. All right. God, we do recognize that we are in a dire situation, um, kind of unforeseen in most of our um, living memories, God. And I just want to recognize that we're facing a very powerful and unseen enemy in this virus. And yet we know that you are absolutely in control. We know that you could speak a word and this virus would be completely obliterated from the face of the earth. And we just recognize how powerful you are. We recognize that you are the one who can offer us and our loved ones and our children complete and miraculous and divine protection from contracting this virus. And we also recognize that some of us are going to get sick, God. And we just, in all of these acknowledgements, we stand in awe of you and just admit and recognize that you are so powerful and so sovereign, and we come to you with total humility and just ask for your grace, Lord. Give us grace to um, not contract this disease. Give us grace to handle the uncertainty. Give us grace for those of us who, who may fall sick to endure and to stay strong in our spirits. And God, just let your grace extend across the whole globe to increase the level of peace and comfort and rest and to decrease the degree of fear and panic. And please especially be with these hospitals making these terrible decisions. And I just pray that the ventilator shortage that people are so scared about, that that would no longer be an issue, Father God. I just pray that you would slow down or stop or decrease the spread of this disease to the extent that these doctors and nurses who are so scared of having to make these horrible decisions, we pray that that wouldn't happen, God. And even if it does, we recognize that you are the one on the throne 
And all we can do right now, God, is just wait and see how this pans out. And it's hard and frightening, but what a gift that you've given us, that we do have hope in you, Father God. And I just pray that everybody listening would be overwhelmed by that hope right now and that it would sustain them through the good times and the bad times and the scary times and the uncertain times. Um, and I pray for Alaska with all of its unique situations with people out in villages and off the road system or hours away from medical care. You, go, you know every single one of their names and situations. And I do pray for protection for these very remote villages, just that you would allow them to remain isolated enough that this virus doesn't, doesn't touch them, Lord, and be blessing the flight nurses in Alaska. I'm sure they're worried and scared and we just pray for your grace to cover our state and cover our world. God, we just thank you for this time, even to talk about the difficult things. I just pray that nobody would come away from this episode feeling downcast or hopeless. I just pray that some of these hard discussions would draw out some of our feelings, um, some of our fears that we could just take and lay at your feet, Lord, and, and lay that um, fear and anxiety and discouragement or even despair at your feet and take in its place love and joy and peace and hope that we would be able to carry around with us, God, that you would just remind us who you are, how great you are, how victorious you are, that you are a victor over sin and death and disease and all kinds of situations that look hopeless. You're the God of hope. And we just pray that you would just pour out your spirit on our country, on our world today. God, that you would just be glorified in every way possible through this. And we do pray specifically for the people making decisions right now about hospital policies and the, the DNR, um, things like that, Lord, that you would just give them total godly wisdom, wisdom that the world doesn't have. I just pray that you would give them wisdom to know how to structure things so that they can maximize protection for these amazing doctors and nurses and medical staff and um, also maximize life. And only you can do that, Lord. Only you can, can help them make those decisions. I just pray specifically that you would raise up Christians within the healthcare um, world to be praying in their workplaces, to be praying for their coworkers, for their superiors, for their patients, and just unleashing your power in hospitals all over the world right now, God. And we just know that you are faithful to call your people to pray. And we just pray for each one of us listening, Lord, that you would help us, prompt us to pray, give us specific things that we need to be praying for um, to just usher your will here on earth as it is in heaven. And God, we just pray for those that are um, in isolation in whether it's personally isolated or people that live in isolated um, villages or towns where medical treatment is hard to come by. We just pray for these um, decisions that are being made about the villages in Alaska and how to provide transportation for people showing symptoms and these babies and children that need treatment for RSV that aren't able to get that right now. God, we just pray for, again, that wisdom that the world doesn't offer, that you would give people the, the knowledge of what can be done, the creativity and the insight to know how to make it possible for us to be protected and safe, as well as getting treatment to those that need it, especially the, the children. And God, we just pray for our leaders. We pray for our nation's leaders, um, for all of those that are listening, praying for their nation's leaders. We pray for the leaders in the world, leaders at the local level. Um, God, we just pray that you would guide them and direct them in just open their eyes to um, to, to what is at stake here. We just pray that, that they would have that balance of, um, of not being driven by fear, but being driven by, um, by information, that you would get them accurate information to help them project what is going to be needed in terms of supplies, um, that you would just give these leaders um, 
just a glimpse of, of what is going to be needed. Because again, only you know the future. There's no way for even the best leader in the world to know the future, but you do, God. And we just pray that you would rain down your wisdom and your insight on those making decisions. And we just pray now, God, that we would go out from here and be a light in the world. Even though we can't go out into our world and interact with people in the same way as we could, God, there are so many avenues for communication and encouragement within our homes, um, within our circle on social media or um, other people that we come into contact with and communication with. Lord, help us to just be a light and point people to you in every single way possible. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you. I'm going to hope that uh, next time we have, whoops, sorry, I just muted myself, happier stories for you guys. But again, I think that sometimes we do just need to look into the abyss and realize that no matter how abysmal it is, God is on the throne. So I hope that that leaves you guys encouraged. Jamie, wish you and your family continued safety and good health. Yep. And we will talk to you all soon.